uh, was a real shot in the dark and a vision to build this bridge. And uh, when you look at it today, it's remarkable that it's still there, knowing the story of how it blew down five years after it was built. Part of the reason it blew down is because they didn't build it right. They did the best they could at the time. But when a big wind came down the Ohio, it was too much for the bridge, and so it flapped a while, and then it just fell into the river. And when they rebuilt it, they modified it so that it wouldn't do that again. And when the uh, Northwest Territory was developing, you can imagine what it meant to hear the rumble of the Conestogas as they went across that bridge by the hour going into Ohio, the settlers into that area. Uh, just an enormous, important link for Virginia into the Ohio country coming right through our front door. With 1849, you had the suspension bridge. We know what that meant. And it was one thing right after another. 49, the bridge. 53, the railroad. Just imagine what that could have meant to a small city. Just hordes of people coming in from all directions. One thing that I admire about our ancestors, they must have been fighters. The National Road was supposed to have gone to Wellsburg. For whatever reasons, it came to Wheeling. I think it was just tenaciousness. They wanted the road here. They fought Wellsburg for it, and they won. And the same with the bridge. They wanted that bridge built. In those days, there were very few suspension bridges in the whole country, and still fewer people who could build them. They had to convince all the powers that be that this was a good idea because a suspension bridge over the river had never been done before. You see, it wasn't until about 1920 or 21 that we had dams in the river here in Wheeling. And that kept a pool stage of nine feet, which was adequate for you know, higher river boats. But of course, I remember the flood where every, the island was entirely covered. I can also remember droughts when the river wasn't anymore out here at Ninth Street in Wheeling, uh, it wasn't any more than six feet wide. And as young kids, we'd get back and take a long run and jump all the way over the river and get there without getting her feet wet. Gonna take the Mississippi, the Monongahela and the Ohio. Remember that this was the frontier, that the river was by treaty the edge of the western frontier, that across the Ohio was Indian country, was the Ohio country. So this was the farthest any white man could go. And to understand why Wheeling was so important, it, it was one of the first cities in Virginia to be established on this river and at the edge of the frontier. Why did Wheeling grow here before some of these other places? That's because there's a plateau, a high, flat area, high so it wasn't down on the river and getting flooded, and flat so the man could build on it. The valley is rather steep-walled. The bottom of the valley is flat, only about twice the width of the river itself. The river meanders back and forth in its valley as it widens it and deepens it. The fact that the river is meandering back and forth in the valley, you have the floodplain in pieces, a little patch here and a little patch on the other side, but they alternate. And since we build towns on the floodplains along the Ohio River here, at least from East Liverpool down to Parkersburg, you very rarely find a town across from a town. They alternate with each other. We build on all the flat places first, <laughs> it's logical. And that's the area from 11th Street back up to, oh, I don't know, 8th or, 8th or 7th, somewhere in there. And there's a fairly large flat area there. Ohio has such a personality. Yesterday, it was like a clear lake mirroring the autumn trees. Today, it might very well be raging with white caps. It has a different face uh, on any given day. 
And of course, then you look down the valley and you see the hills and you realize that over all these thousands of years, this water has carved the land to its own image, in a sense. And when Wheeling was founded, this was the edge of the frontier. So across the river was the Ohio country, and the main tribe in this region was the Shawnee. They had their main villages around Chillicothe, then the Wyandots, the Delaware, and of course the Mingo right on the Ohio. Yeah. When I stand at a place with a vista like this, I am drawn back to the early days of this valley and this settlement. And I try to put myself in the place of the Zanes and to imagine what it would have been like when all you could see were giant trees with huge grapevines clustered above them. And when you could see bountiful deer and uh, all the animals of that frontier period. And when you could see nothing but green and river and when you were the first to be here and to actually lay claim to this land, how exciting that must have been. In those days, you couldn't have gotten a good view unless you went high and really looked out through the forest and saw the river and saw the island, that beautiful big island covered with trees, and to understand why Ebenezer said, this is paradise. To think that this area at one time had been an ocean was a fascinating thing to me. It at one time had been a swamp, uh, consequently the coal beds that came from the swamps. It had been a desert with a bay in this area, covered most of Ohio and West Virginia and western Pennsylvania. And the seawater that went into it dried up and evaporated and left behind thick layers of salt. So this area has been almost every environment at one time or another, just alternating and switching back and forth. And most of those things, too, are why industry is here. The salt beds are the basis of most of the chemical industry that's up and down the Ohio River. They pump hot water down into the ground, and it melts and dissolves the salt, and then they pump the brine back, and they use the salt for many different chemicals coupled that with some of the natural gas, the hydrocarbons, that's really the basis of the chemical industry here. The 1830s were one of the boom times for wheeling. Uh, with the coming of the National Road in 1818, we already had small industrial growth, but that really gave a uh, launching pad for new industries, more industries, more people coming, uh, perhaps with the idea of going west and saying, this is a place where I can make my home and make a decent living and staying here. So uh, the 1830s were a tremendous time of growth in this area. And one of the things that people don't realize, the animals that were involved in building the city of Wheeling, the horses, the mules, how they used these teams of horses to pull these big stones up like on the bridge here. They didn't have all these cranes and everything like we get, scaffolds and everything. They built their scaffolds out of the forest. They cut down the trees and they built their own scaffolds. And how they dug, you imagine they didn't have the, the things that did, they dug by hands. I just pictured them laying all these bricks all through Wheeling. Paving the brick in Wheeling were done by some of the colored people, the black people, more like slaves and that that they had. You just can't imagine how many brick were made in Wheeling. It was called Brick City. I was a the latter 19th, early 20th century is the, the period in which Wheeling was probably the most uh, vibrant in terms of its history. The, the population was growing, the businesses were growing, the, the city was a, a vibrant area for public theater, for music, 
I guess any kind of measure that you would want to look at, I call this period uh, wheeling the, the premier city of the state. And by any standard measure, whether it's population or economic activity, you know, one third of all the industrial activity in the state of West Virginia was in the city of Wheeling at the turn of the century. 40% of all the labor was at Wheeling. It had that vibrancy to it. You could see the trains coming in and out. If you, if you, and if you see pictures from that period, You'll see the downtown, it's just jam-packed with people and vehicles there. there and depending upon the year, I mean, you, you could see pictures that have uh, trolleys and horse transportation and the early automobiles and, the, and Main Street and Market Street just, just packed. And that would be generally true, I think, probably down through the 1940s when cities were still the focal point. In the days before airplanes, salesmen would come in, say, from New York. They'd come in on the Pennsylvania Railroad down along the river here and stay in Wheeling one day overnight and maybe the next day and then take the train back to New York. And a great many of them arranged to stay at the Fort Henry Club. Fine New York jewelers would come with the pocket full of diamonds and other beautiful gems and show them here in Wheeling and sell them. And on Saturday morning, my mother would send me down to the market house, the big white market house where the farmers would bring in this butter, and they'd have it on parchment paper in pounds or two pounds. You'd look at it all through that case, and you'd say, let me taste that one. And they would get a toothpick and put into that pound of butter and give it to you to taste. And every Saturday, the farmers used to come in, and they would only be there maybe on the weekend. Some of them, and then some of them were there all the time. Wheeling was the place to come to shop. It was the big downtown. And even though a lot of the smaller little communities had stores, the bargains and the new fashions and everything was basically in downtown Wheeling. And I'm sure that a lot of people were just downtown to be a part of the activity because there seemed to be so much activity downtown. You can remember the Market Plaza area, which I consider to be Willing's first mini mall, had a multitude of different things you could do there, from bowling to entertainment to poultry buying, vegetable buying, restaurants. Yeah, it was wide open. They had a lot of gambling and uh, race tracks horse racing, but it was, it, it was a lot of entertainment, a lot of nightclubs, a lot of floor shows, a lot of music. It was a building they called Margaret Auditorium. They tore it down there. It's where the plaza is, and they have dances up there. And at that time, my husband was working for Coca-Cola, and he would sell Coca-Cola up there at the dance. So this is why he met Count Basie. Cap Calloway, Duke Ellicott. Doc White would have all these bands in to play. That was a great day for the blacks. That was a great day for black people because they, all the women would dress and they'd look pretty and the men look handsome. Talking about dark, tall, dark, and handsome. Mm. They were tall, dark, and handsome. And Mother did a lot of shopping down there. We, her favorite place was going to a, a butcher shop on 12th Street called Baisley's. Remember, she went down there for years, and she always came back with the best daggone peanut butter you ever tasted. And everybody came to town in Wheeling on Saturday. It was just like a big holiday. There were mobs around here, you can't imagine. I mean, it, it was tough in the 40s in this town when I went to high school in town here. You couldn't, 
I packed a lunch because you couldn't get anything to eat in a, in a restaurant. And whatever we were allowed for lunch at that time, 30 or 40 minutes, you couldn't get in them, you know. Wheeling was always the hub. Always the hub. On weekends before the mall, Wheeling was a center of 225,000 people. It was like a party. You came to Wheeling for Christmas shopping, but you also came to Wheeling to have a good time while you're shopping. The women loved it. They'd come to town. They'd do their shopping. They'd go eat at Stone's Tea Room or Grease Tea Room or restaurants downtown, whatever they were. And they had a ball. They had a ball. Walk up down the street, everybody's always laughing. Laughing! The Philip Steamship Company made tremendous steamers on the Ohio. They say some of the finest boats on the Ohio for people to travel where they needed to go. See, in our days, the only entertainment we had was your old showboats that traveled from Cincinnati to Pittsburgh. There was about five or six of them that they put on live plays. Well, the old Water Queen and Majestic, and they'd spend a night each little village, go to Pittsburgh, and then they'd change when they come down and have another play coming back down. That's the only entertainment we had. Yeah, we went to showboats. They were fun. You had a wonderful time. And you eat candy, taffy, and, and uh, just very festive, you know. But real river boats, they can have dancing up on the stage, and uh, women in their flamboyant dresses, and men with their funny stories. And it was uh, a lot of fun. Wheeling at one time built an awful lot of boats. Listen, they rivaled Pittsburgh. Of course, Pittsburgh kept on going. And I, I never could understand why Wheeling quit building boats. The Phillips shipyard was very important here. We built some very fine boats for Ohio River traffic. The Washington, one of the finest and the first of the big steamboats on the Ohio, quite a reputation, built and outfitted right here in Wheeling. My father would take me for long walks through the city sometime and on our way to the movie theater or whatever. We would always walk past the old Hemfield Yards. That's located where the Social Security office and the public library is today, looking down to right around uh, where the B&O building would be. I can remember my dad taking me on a passenger train and, and just walking up on it. And, Show it, show it, it would have looked like inside. I'd never taken a train ride before, but I can remember all the passenger trains in Wheeling. There were just hundreds of them. There were always trains in Wheeling. Everywhere you looked, it seemed like there was either a train going across the trussle, uh, a train parked on a track somewhere. Trains were just something you lived with in the downtown area. The years it took to build the B&O, and if you know anything of railroad building, it was a tremendous chore to get across the mountains. And the fact that it was coming from Baltimore to Wheeling, Virginia, my goodness, I mean, we were the other end of that great railroad. And that's another place I'd like to relocate back into history and to have been there when that first train came in, when they had the huge banquet and toasted themselves and, and everyone that had worked on the railroad all those many years, because it took years and years and years to finance. and and the manpower 
uh, we look today at the roadbed and, and uh, we take it all for granted and we've lost the railroad uh, tracks. And, and, uh, but what it took to build that resource to this city is unbelievable. The iron. Down in the 17th Street area of Wheeling, there were trains that went right past people's houses. The houses sat right on the tracks. I can remember as a boy, we lived on Lynn Street, and I can remember going to sleep by train hearing the trains on the tracks, the wheels, you know, and just lay there and listen to train after train and the whistles going. Now that's kind of a sad silence that we have now with no trains. That was a big part of our link to the rest of the country. But the river is still a major highway for goods and large cargo. During those 1870s, 1880s into the high Victorian, Wheeling flourished flourished as a center, a city of industry, also of the arts, great shows that were brought in, the, the early circuses. I'd love to have seen Pawnee Bill Wild West show, and also we had Buffalo Bill Cody's nationally, internationally famous show. Everybody came to Wheeling. It was the place to come. It was a place to be. It's hard to believe that, but it was... Lindbergh came here, you know, I mean, he made a stop. Oh, the day Lindbergh came... <laughs> that was a big day for Wheeling. It was in May, I remember. And he had just made his flight. And uh, I ran down from 7th Street to 10th and saw Lindbergh come around the corner from Market to Maine. And he went down Maine. And everybody was screaming and yelling. I think that must have been 26 when Lindbergh was there. Oh, yes. The town was jammed, jammed. Everybody always turned out for everything in Wheeling. The latter 19th, early 20th century is the, the period in which Wheeling was probably the most uh, vibrant in terms of its history. The, the population was growing, the businesses were growing, um, the, the city was a, a vibrant area for public theater, for music. Any, I guess, any kind of measure that you would want to look at. Uh, it isn't as though somebody came from a uh, graduate school in business, you know, and came in here and started these steel mills. They, they didn't. These were hard working hard-drinking gamblers that, that did this because they, they, they gambled with everything they had on these operations. Our parents babysitted the neighbor kids. They slept in our beds and vice versa. There was more of a community, I believe. Most of the men worked at Blonox Foundry. They worked in the coal mine. And there were all different cultures. I remember the Penco family. I remember the Ralston family. And I want to say Varla's. Their names were different, but their races were irrelevant at that time. It, it didn't register to me that the Varla's was a Greek family or that the Penco was Italian. You know, the Melanovskis were Polish. I didn't realize it at the time. You know, and uh, all I knew is we played ball together, played hide and seek together. Nassine's pool room used to be on Main Street. Eamon's restaurant, that was across the street. Bryce's Dime Dance. The Oasis Cafe, they're gone. There used to be a lot of factories down there. Warwick, China, then there was the Wheeling Tile Works and the Wheeling Stamping. All those buildings were on that side of the street. They employed a lot of people. A lot of people worked in those places. There were a lot of produce stores down there. 
uh, Jebbia Salina used to be on the corner of 21st and Main. And the entrance was on the corner of the building. Then there was Jebbia Metz. There was White and Stobbs, Krogel and Top. They were all produce companies along. on the 23rd block was Gaffrey's store, which was owned by Nick Gaffrey, and he had a brother, and their family had the store, and uh, in that block was just uh, Blue Ribbon, and there were a couple little nightclubs that, uh, that was visited, but most of it was a residential area. It was a mix of people. There was German, Polish, Italian, Syrian, it was a different mixture. There was a neighborhood and a half down there because we had all the industry was in that neighborhood. We had railroad people, steel people, the tile works. We had uh, people who were the box factory up there, Steinmetz Box Factory. We had the railroad workings in that area. We had pottery plants, we had sawmills, we had construction companies, just to name a few, and they all came to my dad's restaurant to eat. And they would come in and eat from 10 o'clock in the morning until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And at one point my mother wanted my dad to upgrade. George, let's put some new paint on the walls and change the tables, the booths, and my father said, no. He serves working men who come in here dirty. There's a sink in the corner to wash in. If they want to sit down, they bring a woman. They want to sit down at the tables. They've got the back room. One of the things that I've talked to my two kids about that uh, they don't have the experience of is the opportunity to just understand that, well, like my friend's grandparents still only spoke Italian or only spoke Polish and some of the signs in the store fronts were in English and Polish and and that's just nothing that you see anymore around and and that was I think a really nice flavor to add to a childhood where you had that sense of the old world as part of your daily existence back on it now, I thought, I keep thinking, what an era, what an era that I've lived through. I must have wrote 500 books about that era. And I pick up one of these books and, and I read it, it just sounds like, a, you know, it happened right here in Weaning because we, I, I just witnessed the same thing. And that's, a, that's, a, that's exciting to read a book and you know, feel like you know the character personally. And some of the characters I did know personally. 